As a newcomer to the foster home, Liz can't escape the fate of being bullied either. During dinner, a freshly served bowl of steaming hot soup attacks her shoulder, catching Liz off guard. The sudden stinging pain makes her scream involuntarily. What's even more frightening is that the foster home staff won't uphold justice for them. Instead, they blame Liz. From what I can see, you've got a discipline problem. Hearing those heartless words from the staff, Liz's heart just plummets into hell and she's completely devastated. On Liz's first day at the foster home, she witnesses bullying firsthand in the restroom. She sees a girl with a spider tattoo on her arm mixing highly corrosive disinfectant with shampoo evenly, then calmly placing it in front of the bathroom curtain, arms crossed, silently awaiting the outcome of her retaliation. Soon, agonizing cries emanate from the bathroom. The girl glances back, satisfied, and leaves the restroom. Liz stares in terror, unable to believe what she has just witnessed. After seven long years of perseverance and hard work, she finally manages to escape the welfare home and tracks down the current place where her mother and sister are. Surprisingly, her originally mentally messed up mother has actually managed to successfully kick the habit and become clear-headed and recognizes her. They give a tight hug, and then go shopping together, hit the coffee shop, sit and chat, and also chow down on hamburgers. Liz is feeling that long-lost maternal love and is super happy. Liz starts to get greedy. She's thinking that if only her dad can quit drugs too, then their whole family can really be reunited and go back to living in the home on University Street. But her mom tells her that their home is long gone, cause he couldn't pay the rent, her father got kicked out and is living in a shelter, and the only thing that belongs to Liz, that encyclopedia the neighbor grandma gave her, that's tossed away too. Liz can't believe this is for real. She rushes back overnight to that little apartment that holds all her happy memories and finds it's completely empty inside with nothing left. She really has no home anymore. The only place she can go now seems to be just the school. Liz always believes that learning can change her fate. She gets herself all cleaned up, puts on some still decent clothes she bought from the thrift store, and with her mom's company, comes to a nearby school that's specifically set up for orphans to sign up. Here, Liz meets a girl named Chris. Maybe it's cause of the similar experiences. They get along great and Liz shows the naughtiness and energy of a teenage kid for the first time. Everything is moving in a good direction. But then, some crappy stuff is happening again. The mom who is already detoxified successfully gets addicted to alcohol once more. And she often comes home drunk as a skunk from the bars. And her body is getting weaker day by day. On this day, when Liz is entertaining the newly met classmates at her grandpa's place, the mom gets drunk again. She cries and collapses into Liz's arms, muttering that she's a bad mom and she just wants a hit. Liz feels the weird looks from the classmates and she feels a bit embarrassed, but she still stays by her mom's side and gently helps her clean up the puke on her body. All the classmates leave, only Chris remains, like a loyal listener, quietly listening to her telling the story about her mom, a story that drives both mom and mom's sister crazy. When they are really young, they are both violated by the closest people they should have trusted and relied on. Suddenly, Chris sticks the burning cigarette into the palm of her hand. She had that same thing when she was seven. And now, her mom actually wants to take her back to live with that man. Liz really feels for Chris's experience. Move in with me. What, stay here? Yeah. Well, what will your grandfather say? Just like what Chris says, Liz has no say at all in this family. Not to mention that the owner here is her grandfather whom she reckons as a jerk. When he finds out about Chris's existence, he goes ballistic and kicks them out. 15-year-old Liz starts to roam around. Drifting here and there seems to be her unavoidable destiny. Liz is born into a family where both parents are junkies, and the mom also has serious schizophrenia. Every time the drug addiction kicks in, she grabs the relief funds that the sisters rely on to survive. When the mom goes nuts, the dad always just sits there silently on the sofa, either watching TV or holding a book, turning a blind eye to the cries for help from the two daughters. Looking at the mom's humble and pleading look, Liz can't harden her heart and hands the only living expense to her. The successful woman shows a weird smile and then rushes right out to chase after her fun. The man also chases after and follows behind his wife, turning into a crowded and mixed up street and then vanishing. Hungry Liz can only pick up food from the garbage can like a wandering waif to fill her stomach. Even so, Liz doesn't resent her parents and never feels sad because she thinks she can handle it. Later, when the mom starts to go crazy again due to the drug addiction attack, she is taken away after being injected with a tranquilizer by the cops and sent to compulsory detox. Liz watches the mom being tied up all over and struggling in pain. She cries and chases after, and is finally restrained by the staff. She helplessly watches the car door close and then drives out of her view. Eight-year-old Liz is wide awake and rational. She realizes that the only chance to change her fate is to study, so she never misses every exam at school. She has to pass the exam and not get held back. Cause the bathtub at home is broken, Liz hasn't taken a bath or changed clothes for a long time, and there's a funky smell on her. She's disliked by her classmates, and everyone keeps their distance from her. 
When the teacher spots Liz, she walks right up and tries to take her exam paper. She doesn't think a kid who skips class every day can finish the exam. I'll take it. It doesn't look that hard. Under her insistence, the teacher gives in. Amazingly, Liz, who never goes to class, actually gets a full score and catches the teacher's attention big time. When school's out, she stops Liz who's about to leave, hands her a bag of clean clothes, and then asks how she manages to score 100. After learning that Liz just reads a picked up encyclopedia, the teacher's really surprised. She sees the huge potential in the girl. She doesn't want such a talented kid to miss out on learning and end up as an average Joe, repeating the fate of her parents. So the teacher makes a deal with Liz that she has to keep coming to school every day. If Liz doesn't show up for school, she'll call the welfare home. Finally, the teacher gives that full score paper to Liz and tells her to take it home. Liz excitedly runs home and shows her neighbor lady her achievement, and all this is thanks to the encyclopedia that lady gave her. While the old lady's happy for her, she also tells Liz good news that her mom's back. Liz is super excited and can't wait to run home to share her joy with mom, but the smile on her face vanishes the instant she sees her mother. She sits on the sofa dejectedly, strokes her daughter's hair with a sad expression, and then cries and says to Liz, I'm always here to protect you. I'm always here. Always. Her mom's words confuse Liz until she sees the bloodstains on her hand. Then Liz realizes what's going on. She's got a disease. A serious AIDS. The mother can't take it anymore. She decides to take the two daughters back to her father's place to live. But that place is like another hell for them. Knowing the nature of her grandfather, Liz doesn't want to go back and she chooses to stay with her father. She stubbornly thinks they can go back to the past and the whole family can get together and live again. But that's just her wishful thinking. The sudden family change makes Liz forget the deal with the teacher and she doesn't go to school for a long time. The welfare home staff show up and they're gonna send her to the children's shelter. Liz panics. She hurriedly explains to the staff that she'll definitely go back to school and study hard. And she's not alone either. She's got a father and he'll surely take good care of her. However, her trusted father has already packed her clothes and hands Liz over to the welfare home staff himself. Liz is desperate and the tears keep flowing like crazy and won't stop. She keeps looking back at her father, longing for him to keep her. But the man remains silent. Liz is sent to the hell-like welfare home and lives a miserable life of being bullied and picked on until she manages to escape seven years later. She finds her mother but is driven away by her grandfather. Liz has to pack her luggage and leave this home that never belongs to her. Before leaving, Liz finds her already very sick mother, looks at her silently for a long time, and finally says her love for her with tears in her eyes. Liz loses her home and family once more and starts wandering around all by herself. Fate keeps pushing Liz into the tightest spots over and over, but she remains tough all along, just like a weed growing by the roadside, defiantly growing in the face of strong winds and heavy rains. She sleeps on the 24-hour running subway, survives by begging and stealing, and does everything she can to keep herself alive. Even though life is tough, Liz never forgets to study. Whenever she has a bit of free time, she grabs a book and eagerly absorbs the nutrients within. She firmly believes that reading can change her destiny. Until this day, Liz walks into the bar her mother often frequents and accidentally learns about her death. Liz runs like crazy. The rain pelts down on her head, flows from her hair into her eyes. But it's so strange that no matter how much she cries, there are never any tears spilling out of her eyes. When she gets to the cemetery, her mother has already been put into a simple coffin by strangers. There's no priest, no prayer, and definitely no gravestone. Liz can't help but ask, will she be scared in there? She watches as her mother's coffin is lifted up and placed in the pre-dug hole. Liz knows that when the soil fills it up again, she'll lose her forever. The only things that can be left are some fragments of her actions and the air. That's what she remembers. Liz lies on her mother's coffin and is reluctant to leave. The few happy memories of being with her mother, like a projector that won't stop, keep flashing in her mind one after another. It's not until the staff urges her that she leaves step by step, looking back constantly, and then silently measures the steps of leaving. She wants to remember, always remember where her mother is. After her mother dies, Liz realizes that she really has no home and no way back now. And the only thing she can hold on to now is her future. Liz decides to go back to school and not repeat her mother's tragic fate. Because it's too far away, Liz misses the school interview time. She has to find a way to win the principal's approval and regain the opportunity to enter school. She stops the principal who's about to leave and tries hard to explain her desire to climb out of the quagmire of her original family and live a better life. But the principal asks her, why now? Liz says, I love my mom, and I keep waiting, imagining that one day she'll get better and come to take care of me again. But the truth is, she has never taken care of me. I'm the one taking care of her, as if she were my child. Now that she's gone, it's time to take care of myself. Okay, you're in. The principal is really moved by Liz and admits her right on the spot. 
back in school again. Liz doesn't want to waste a single minute. She aims to complete the four-year courses within just two years. This sure ain't an easy thing. Liz basically has a book with her all the time, whether it's during the break between classes or in the gaps while she's working. This kind of regular and fulfilling life makes Liz feel that long-lost sense of security. With Liz's unwavering perseverance, she becomes the top student in the whole school and gets the chance to visit Harvard University, and all the travel expenses are covered by the school. Liz looks at the brochure of the school, and she knows her efforts haven't been for nothing. Accompanied by the principal, she finally steps onto the land of Boston and comes to visit Harvard University. She just stares in awe at the clean and bright teaching buildings and the students with eyes full of stars and the ocean. Liz is really shocked. What makes them different? Is it cause of where they were born? If I work even harder, could I get closer to them, or maybe even touch them? All these doubts and thoughts slam into Liz's brain, and she finally finds the place she wants to go and the person she wants to be. She wants to be on an equal footing with these people at Harvard University instead of being beneath them. But the high cost of tuition of Harvard University is enough to shatter all of Liz's fantasies about the new world, but she doesn't give up and tries hard to find a way to get a scholarship. Finally, she discovers a new scholarship program from the New York Times. As long as Liz finishes an essay on a specified topic as required and passes the interview, she can get a $12,000 scholarship for four consecutive years, which is more than enough to support her studies. Liz finishes and mails her essay on her 18th birthday and gets recognized by the New York Times successfully. During the interview, Liz says something like this. And I really, I got lucky because any sense of pulled out from under me, so I was forced to look forward. I was no going back. Kids without shoes just gotta run hard and keep moving forward if they want to possibly change their fates and get a whole new life. Liz pulls it off. She becomes the miracle girl in America and gets praised by everybody. When a friend asks again, who the heck would care what kind of trash I turn out to be? Liz can tell her for sure, I myself do. She can enter Harvard University to study along with those with a good birth, be on an equal footing with them instead of beneath them. If you like my channel or enjoy watching me dance, please leave a comment in the comment section saying dance. Adam.